We are very, very pleased that you're all here for what I think is an extraordinary occasion. I say that in the context of two ways, and Norman Foster and other friends of you of mine who are here will understand the, uh, the respect with which I say this. I get into trouble sometimes. Uh, we had the opening of Parliament yesterday, which is a glorious occasion in which you, you see the English constitutional history kind of unfold to the personalities and the pomp and circumstance. Um, it was interesting how Her Majesty started her speech saying that my government is committing to the, committed to the modernization of this country. And it's interesting because as those of us thinking on Paul Rudolph's career and his work know that there's not an inconsistency between a modernist and modernization view and the respect for context and for tradition as well. I get into trouble with Her Majesty occasionally. Last year, I was invited to Commonwealth House on Commonwealth Day. I was standing by the door and it swung open and I stepped out of the way and who was it but the Queen. And since we have the occasion, I'm so privileged to see her frequently, she recognized me and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't have a moment to think, so I just responded, my country's part of the Alumni Association. <laughs> well, I say that because all of us here with an interest in or careers in architecture, are part of the Paul Rudolph Alumni Association. And Norman will go to particular lengths to describe the extent to which a practice, a life, a style, design motifs and concepts were developed from that work. But I have to think all of us have been influenced in one manner, shape, or form who have an interest in the use of space and who have a knowledge and commitment to the way the use of space impacts the human spirit. Now, it's extraordinary for me to have the privilege of doing this because I'm what you call a Harvard man. You remember when President Kennedy received an honorary degree from Yale, he said he was the luckiest man in America because he now had a Yale degree but a Harvard education. <laughs> <laughs> so to be able to welcome you to a celebration of a former dean at Yale is an extraordinary privilege for me. I want to thank you for taking the time and the interest to come to the embassy. It's an honor for all of us to, to think that you're focusing on the impact of one man and his thought and his work. Uh, thanks to Luton University and John Wiley's book and what you're doing tonight may bring more attention and certainly more credit to a remarkable life. Mr. Ambassador, my lord, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have indeed assembled this evening to celebrate the achievements of one of America's great modern architects. Soon after Paul Rudolph died in 1997, in August 97, a group of Yale architectural graduates, including myself, thought it appropriate uh, to try and hold an event as a tribute to him for his uh, work and his career, and also as an appreciation uh, of his influence on their own subsequent careers. Two years later, this evening, and the production of this book, which is surprisingly the first book uh, about him for 25 years, are the culmination of their efforts. What I didn't know when my University of Luton allowed me to embark on the research for this biography was the fact that all Paul Rudolph's work had been bequeathed to the Library of Congress in Washington. Uh, I then discovered that the library uh, would not make uh, this information available until one day the trust was eventually in funds. So this book covering these missing 25 years specifically uh, has been produced and assembled from original sources. Although this has made the acquisition of the material much harder uh, to obtain the results, the publication is consequently more scholarly and more authentic. It contains many of Rudolph's personal drawings which have never been printed before. Uh, to obtain this material, I had to establish contact with a large family of his friends and colleagues around the world, they are around the world, who contributed generously to, uh, with their time and uh, the information. This publication is therefore their book, as it much is mine. Indeed, the pen portraits in this book by six of my fellow graduates, including Norman Foster's in important introduction, 
provide an interesting insight uh, to Paul Rudolph himself. We're of course also indebted to uh, Wiley Academy for their hardworking staff for the high quality of this production and to the Building Centre Trust who have funded this exhibition. Time this evening, ladies and gentlemen, only permits me to give you a brief summary covering the important steps in Paul Rudolph's career. Paul Marvin Rudolph was born in Kentucky in 1918. Son of a Methodist minister um, and a mother who was a teacher, uh, he took his first architectural degree at Alabama Polytechnic. After spending time in the war in the Navy, where he obtained his All-American Crew Cut, for which he was everlasting famous. Uh, he then went to Harvard, uh, we ought to tell the ambassador, for his master's degree and studied under Walter Gropius and graduated in 1947. He practiced for 10 years with uh, Ralph Twitchell and eventually the practice became, I, de I understand, Rudolph. Uh, it was, he was then appointed chairman of the Department of Architecture at Yale University when at the, only at the age of 39 in 1957. A very um, imaginative appointment. His period at Yale was memorable. He left only eight years later in 1965 to devote his time to his prolific and expanding practice. By then he had formulated his design philosophy which refined his career over a massive number of commissions located all over the world. His reputation continued to grow during the 60s and early 1970s and then uh, because of the adverse reaction to his ubiquitous use of concrete he went out of fashion. America lost interest in him but even though he was unpublicized he continued to design impressive quality projects which were built and still are highly regarded in Asia and the Far East. Uh, he, ex he experimented with the use of steel and glass in the, Kong, in the Bond Center in Hong Kong and other, other places. But then he reverted back confidently to use his in situ concrete again, but this time clad with white tiles and when he produced his most distinguished building uh, in the Wismala Dimala headquarters in Jakarta at the conclusion of his career. And I'll just illustrate that more in a short while. Rudolph's philosophy, which was important, I think, to him and important to, of course, all, uh, all uh, students and friends of, of Rudolph, uh, developed um, when he became a very important figure in post-war modern American architecture. And his uh, influence was during the golden years in the 1960s when American influence was universal. Paul Rudolph and Louis Kahn were the two leading architects who at the time advocated a new design approach and a change at that particular point from the Mies van der Rohe and his philosophy which indeed was developed on repetitive, tended to be repetitive square and steel glass boxes, uh, developed the philosophy at that time less is more. Rudolph reacted against such mass-produced mechanised buildings which he considered were inhuman and as inhibiting, especially when they lacked, to him, the historic virtues of good architecture. Rudolph was impressed always with the control and light of space. The, the ambassadors referred to that already, and you'll hear me re repeat it. The control of light and space, particularly in classical buildings and in uh, uh, Le Corbusier's buildings and others and the freedom of expression that couldn't be found in the international style. It was with that ethos of space and light that Rudolf follows in many respects uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier, both of which I think were his two main influences. He was a contemporary of course but much younger than Louis Kahn. His, 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 his work of elegant spaces, elegant proportions and elegant buildings, I think, influenced a, a new generation of young architects. Paul Rudolph was a key figure in the evolution which led on to Richard Meyer and others. While at Yale, as director, he engaged uh, the intellectual uh, white Russian Serge Shemayev, which Norman and I will remember with, with great affection, who was in fact the partner of Eric Mendelssohn and also a young architectural tutor, who I didn't actually quite uh, realise until a long time afterwards, a fellow called Robert Venturi. 
Um, and uh, of course, at the time, he was expounding his liberal ideas and wrote the architectural bestseller in the 1960s, Complexity and Contradictions in Architecture. And I had to look back in my Yale book to realise that it was Venturi, but he was one of my tutors. But Rudolph's approach to it was therefore not very stylistic. He, in fact, would encourage people who had imaginative ideas and were therefore important figures and had a contribution to education. So he wasn't particularly advocating a particular, particular style. Rudolf, I believe, was always a convinced late modernist. Charles Jenks might have a view of that. But um, my, my belief, he was always no more than a modernist and a late modernist. His projects were functional and sculptural, were all radically different. Charles Jenks doesn't agree with that. Um, you, united around a cent central theme using light and space, and he didn't move far from the functional and structural origins of his design. His architecture was indeed functional sculpture. Here, here we have the, the Yale uh, Architectural School, for which he's famous, but I'm only going to illustrate at the moment to show you that I believe it was functional sculpture. I believe that that is a piece of sculpture of, in concrete, in, in minimal materials, textured, uh, and when I went to, to Yale, uh, we were preoccupied with economy, brutalism, flat roofs, square boxes, and the excitement of seeing roofscapes and buildings which are heavily articulated were indeed, to my mind, an uplifting experience. Individual buildings, well, an individual building, which that to me was an amazing building. His control of light and space were indeed Rudolph's priorities. Um, this, this one's the entire inside of the Orange County um, Court. This one is the inside of the Tuskegee uh, Chapel, all concerned with space and control of light and space. He was so preoccupied with light and space that the Art and Architecture Building in Yale was designed a, as a tour de force of spatial elements. It was said that it was not even possible to use the toilets in the building without having a spatial experience. <laughs> he strove to create elegant proportions, and his buildings were all unified by one grand idea. It might be a space, it might be an element, and this is the Wismar de Mala, which I have a great regard for, which, as you can appreciate, was unified well, by one particular large idea, the use of one material, basically, and glass, but basically one material. He kept his materials down on his buildings to almost always being just one. And also his other preoccupation as he developed there, and I'll show you later on, was how he developed this particular building out of the site. Uh, the context was another important factor in it. In order to do the art and architecture building at Yale, uh, which you can see there uh, one third the way along on the left hand side, he drew every building in Chapel Street so that he could see, and here, here you can see the horizontals of the uh, Louis Kahn building in contrast to the vertical towers of it. He drew all the other towers as well. Not concerned with that, I, I haven't got a double slideshow production this evening, else I'd be able to show you that that was the other half of his drawing. It went right down to Chapel Green, and some of the elements that was replicated in his design there are elements which are the vertical features of the Gothic uh, towers, which are right down on Chapel Street. The purpose of, uh, but the purpose of almost all of uh, Rudolph's buildings was the function was the generator. The purpose and the use of the building created his designs. He didn't like um, to use elements that were not an adornment on the building, which did not serve any particular purpose. Paul Rudolph said, to ignore what is intrinsic in a building by putting extraneous elements over the exterior is so anti-architecture that I can see no justification in it at all. It leads to world fairyism. And I think that he, that's why he went no farther to develop any post-modernist buildings. Uh, in that respect, he was constantly faithful to his late modernist convictions. 
there was another dimension to, to Rudolf and, and his work, which uh, I must say was the most inspiring part uh, to me, and that was he was a brilliant graphic artist, a brilliant graphic artist. He developed a unique personal drawing technique which, uh, for which he was world famous and renowned. His perspectives seemed to generate the design. Um, this is the Healy Cocoon House, which was one of his first houses in Florida, and there are his, his, his immaculate uh, perspective, um, isometric, of, 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 of that uh, particular building. He is rightly famous for his um, single point perspectives, which he, which he, set, which he set up uh, accurately uh, in order to describe the, the buildings. That was one that wasn't built, um, that was in uh, uh, Palm Beach. Uh, one that was built was the, was the forestry school uh, in Yale. And in order to understand that, again, a single point perspective, um, in order to understand that, he draws every single detail of it. And there it is, exactly as, exactly as it was in the, in the actual drawing, including all the concrete and how the detailing all went. Um, he, was, he correctly illustrated in his sections, though. Now, this is particularly important. I believe he developed a drawing technique, which hasn't been, I haven't seen emulated since, that he illustrated his single point perspectives of sections which were accurately drawn to scale. So a section, a section which is drawn there, is actually, as the cut through the building, is absolutely to scale. So that section of course, is correct, dimensionally correct. And therefore, he was able to take a single point perspective and develop to one particular point all the component parts of it, whether it's seating, whether it's an auditorium like this one in the basement here, whether it was up in the roof, they were all immaculately drawn accurately. And it developed, therefore, a, a system which was illustrating correctly in two dimensions the proportion and the characteristics of that three-dimensional internal space. These drawings were also produced to a huge scale. They were drawn, actually, some of them almost as big as that. Some of the people here who worked in his office will give vouch to that. They were drawn that sort of size, and he would have four people sometimes drawing on, on the same drawing from different corners of it. It was drawn very large in anticipation of it being photographically reduced. And then by cross-hatching the shadows and features, He's meticulously, uh, portrayed, he meticulously portrayed the lighting, the texture, and the functions inside the building, almost with a Victorian precision, almost like Victorian etchings. Some students came to Yale simply to learn his graphic presentation technique. There's no doubt in my mind that there is a, there is a direct correlation between graphical dexterity and architectural creativity, which Paul Rudolph's talent exemplified. His, his work rate was legendary. His productivity was prodigious. He worked mo while he was de dean at, at Yale, um, he worked most evenings and weekends and nights running his expanding practice and taught to manage the architectural school during the day. The cross-fertilization of ideas and, experience, um, and experiences between the professionals and academic activities were beneficial to the students who gained from seeing the realities of his teaching being built. It was indeed an exciting time uh, to be at Yale in the early 1960s, and it's interesting to reflect, as I think we might do, on the number of important architects, including a brace of uh, British architectural lords, Norman Foster here, and Richard Rogers, and many others around the world. I cite Shiniki Okada from around the world who have studied at Yale there at the time under Paul Rudolph and have somehow subsequently become famous in their own right. I'm very interested to know the reason for that. Now I'm going to illustrate very quickly six key projects, I'm not going to go into too much detail, that gives you a, a selection of, of Rudolph's work. So I, c I can't do other than start, of course, with the architecture, art and architecture building at Yale. That, that of course, is the uh, impressive photograph that I've got on the front cover of the book. And um, you can see some 1960s cars zooming around there. But the building um, is the, probably the most controversial building, the best known building he's, he's, he's been responsible for designing. Um, it uh, is such a vibrant and strong building. 
Uh, the concrete techniques go all the way through the building inside and out and it's such a po powerful statement inside. That's uh, to give uh, some of my students, I'm pleased to see here, the idea of how to do a site plan. The site plan of, of the architectural building is there in the bottom left hand corner uh, with the pinwheel of, of the roof and the shadows of all the buildings all the way around correctly illustrating the heights of the buildings nearby. But it shows how he, f he went to great trouble in drawing these, these particular buildings. That was another of his isometrics, to study it very carefully. The, the graphics of the vertical lines, which are quite important in the graphic technique, you'll find became part of the concept and the design of the building. That's one of the elevations, which shows shadows and textures on it. That's a, that's a perspective looking in through the glass, a single point perspective again. Not very well reproduced, but nevertheless, by this slide, but nevertheless shows you the character of the interior of that particular building. Now that's the concrete technique of, of, of the walls. The concrete technique of the walls, you will say, all right, I find them rather uh, abrasive. And indeed, that is, that's, that's true. And in, in fact, it was part of the reason of his demise. But nevertheless, the technique there of of casting concrete against uh, serrated shutters and then individually knocking, the knocking off the surface of it revealed the texture and it, as those buildings mature and uh, they uh, weather you find that they don't change because the technique you get the weathering in the gaps and you get the concrete uh, on, the, on the surface continually like that. It looks exactly like that today. Many, inf many architects around Europe, including myself in Paisley Civic Centre, tried to emulate that particular technique. And that's the, that's the inside of the building. Uh, and as you can see, it's a very strong internal space with, with concrete and the like. I have to just say that the, it was such a strong building that uh, people did find it extremely bit difficult to, um, to work in it. And it's notorious for the fact that the top two floors of the building were engulfed by fire in 1967, when it was rumoured at the time that the tragedy was indeed a, an expression of disgruntled students and was an ultimate demonstration of their criticism of the building. It was that sort of powerful. I am, they were, the, the fire officer's report said it wasn't arson, uh, but nevertheless the, pol the pos possibility of that has always been a, a matter of, of folklore. The building is designed around multi-levels around the criticism and exhibition space in the building and is designed on a pinwheel of mezzanine floors. Spatially um, it uh, creates in individual levels uh, around this central space. The next uh, building I want to show you which is in fact a f uh, was in fact a five-year study and was never built. This, this is an example of the, of the importance of model making to Paul Rudolph and indeed shows you there that that was the model of this particular uh, project. This was a Ford Foundation commission for five, five years to study uh, the effect of the Lower Manhattan Expressway uh, which was going to cut a large uh, fissure through New York and the importance was try to understand how indeed um, the uh, New York could be developed in a way that made sure that buildings didn't uh, um, uh, get despoiled by that particular um, uh, highway. What he, what he produced was a fantastic uh, new set of three-dimensional and two-dimensional drawings um, under the title of the New Forms in the Evolving City and it portrayed a series of brilliantly imaginative single-point perspectives um, and isometrics which shows how these road arter arteries uh, could cover, could provide underground car parking, they could provide transportation nodes, <coughs> monorails, multifunction buildings and they could indeed develop with roof gardens and offices uh, all over this expressway and you can see the expressway underneath. Um, that was done, developed at the same time as his graphic arts centre which was another huge development of two megastructure proposals. And uh, that, that's, a, that's the black and white of that same one. 
The, th the third um, scheme, and jumping on to 6972, um, was the Burroughs Welcome Research uh, Laboratory in North Carolina. This was a huge uh, medical and laboratory centre which demonstrates, I think, um, uh, Rudolph's sculptural style and was a, a huge complex of 300,000 square feet of administrative laboratories. And again, in order to illustrate how it was, what it would be like, he produced his famous single point perspective. Uh, beautifully drawn and studied that internal space. Now, if you concentrate on the internal atria, the central space there, and you see that that is exactly how it was built. He was able to study it in um, two dimensions to make sure that all his various spaces and multi-levels of, um, of, of the building uh, could act together. The point I'd like to make on this particular building, this was built, this was designed in 1670, nearly 30 years ago. And to, to talk about deconstructivism and different expressive and dynamic shapes, this is a particular building which uh, I think showed uh, Rudolph's imaginative design ideas. It's, it's a laboratory uh, building and so indeed that's basically what it looks like. That one was uh, the corridor which I understand was used in, in Star Wars um, and uh, Darth Vader or whatever it was chasing up and down there. But that, that, that is the sort of modernist type of building we're talking of somebody producing in the 1970s. Uh, ten years afterwards, he was asked to do the um, uh, canteen uh, part of the facility. The whole thing was designed on an A-frame at 22 and a half degrees, and he continued to develop that particular part of it, permeating all the way through the buildings. Rudolph was uh, particularly famed for his excellent housing schemes. There's a whole group of housing that I haven't done justice simply by showing you one here and in the, in the exhibition. Uh, this particular one, which is Sid Bass's house, the Bass residence in Fort Worth, Texas, um, shows a, a building which is on a beautiful hillside with calm horizontal layers, distilled like flat roofs and balconies uh, that have got some of the features of Frank Lloyd Wright's horizontal prairie uh, houses. Uh, to make you realise that Rudolph did not only design in, in concrete, this is a building in steel um, and shows how the cantilevers of steel uh, fit all over the particular building. A really dramatic, uh, again designed in 1970, really dramatic uh, building. It was again a house around a courtyard um, with uh, a pinwheel effect which he was quite in, e eager to, to exploit where we had the, the central courtyard, he had the um, private rooms at the front, the service rooms and the bedrooms at, at the rear. Uh, a very big house, I assure you. He, he did uh, some huge office developments in Fort Worth, uh, Sid Bass, so this was the developer's house. And, and that's one of Rudolph's um, isometrics helping to illustrate it. And one of Rudolph's drawings, which um, I'm pleased to say looks to me as though it's upside down. And that's, that's, the, that's uh, again, in black and white, some of the forecourt part of it. And the interiors, which are, of course, a very essential part to the generation of uh, Rudolph's buildings, in white, in colours, where the murals are a very important part of it, um, all adds to the importance of this internal space. And you can see a very spacious, spatial building which uh, opens the, the uh, outside to the inside. And not one story, but two stories and, and balconies on each side behind us extending into it. Uh, the, the results of um, the Lower Manhattan Expressway and the Graphic Arts Center uh, developed uh, quite a number of uh, housing ideas that Rudolph uh, uh, developed. Um, in the Montreal uh, Expo in 1967, uh, Shafty uh, produced his habitat development. Rudolph had the opportunities of the married student housing and other developments to develop these housing principles. This was a condominium 
which consisted of over 100 um, houses, 100 flats. And part of his concept was that mass housing projects could be produced as factory built housing units and manufactured like mobile homes. This in fact is part of the principle, but in fact this is uh, developed much more as an in situ solution. I think the important part of it is his attempt to break down the scale of this very high, high building and the variation on the theme uh, that he was able to uh, develop to make a very interesting um, building. And if you see the plan form, the plan form is consistent going up all these uh, 24 storeys, uh, but the variation on the front elevation helps to um, break down the, uh, the uh, elements of it. Deeply articulated building. And of course it had right down in the foyer some very heavy columns in order to carry the, the structure up above. And that's it looking out uh, over the country. Then lastly, I wanted to show you this building, which uh, is in Wisma de Mala in Jakarta. I think this is especially significant uh, because I think it embodies most of the principles of Rudolf's uh, successful ideas. It was built very late in his career, 82 to 88, 1982 to 1988. Um, it embodied most of his sculptural and modernist design ideas. Um, and it, it was the culmination of the themes he had evolved in those preceding years and in other, other exploratory schemes. It's a 60, it's a 26 storey tower um, and uh, it's cruciform in plan. But I think the important thing is how he has been able to break down the scale of that particular building. First of all, I would say that the, uh, the buildings in the lower forecourt are a part of the hillside in Jakarta. And what he was doing with the podium was to develop uh, a platform on which grew out of the hillside. Then he was building the, the towers uh, with his columns um, coming up through the building. And those columns were quite an important part of the way he used to design. He would never design a column on its own because he believed a column had no direction to it. He would make sure that he had two columns because two columns then had a direction to it. So he's used his two column technique. He would also change the rhythm so that he would have a rhythm of two to one. He would never have a rhythm one, one, one. And the gaps between the columns and the gaps vertically, as you can see what he's done, he's broken, he's changed the rhythm of two floors and then one floor, two floors and one floor. And he's produced a building which um, is very sculptural, very functional sculpture, incorporates uh, much of his concerns about uh, fitting into, into the context. It's a building also that um, shows that his perspective, which he personally drew, this is um, in the Descartes exhibition, personally um, kept by Descartes, who was one of his, um, of his colleagues. And this is Rudolf's drawing of that particular building to show how he very carefully developed the, the ideas. That's the internal space which was so very important to, to Rudolf. Any internal space, he wanted to see it elegant and well proportioned. Now this is in, in the courtyard inside that podium, which I think is six storeys in height, slopes back, has got an internal space, bearing in mind it's very hot there, uh, is creating a space which has got a lot of activities. Um, Rudolf said that the design objectives were to create an atrium courtyard to be like a village with, all, with easy access and variety that villages always possess. In that particular courtyard, he's got pedestrian bridges, walkways, fountains, watercourses, uh, landscaping, hanging gardens, cool breezes, of course, which blew through these open spaces. And uh, he's got coming down through them his twin clusters of columns as well which rose majestically up through this particular courtyard. And that gives you sort of some idea of how the entire space um, uh, um, appears. These are various sort of shots of it uh, open so that you can see that it is cool and it's very, very, very sculptural, spatial, and obviously were parts of his most important uh, uh, aspirations. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that it isn't in concrete. It is in concrete, but it's clad 
in, um, in white tile. So the fact that he was uh, learning that some of the finishes and the textures were equally important as actually the design itself. Now that's the tower, that's the uh, united, the unified tower. You can see all the elements in that particular building very much unified. And you can see the interesting rhythm, piece of music perhaps, what he would refer to, a, a rhythm of two to one going up there, two, two, two floors, one floor, two floor, changing rhythm. Very sculptural, very functional, still is, uh, had to be developed as an office development. And that's one of the balconies that um, uh, each of the office floors uh, had. So really, in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with these, what are indeed brief images, uh, and the personal belief that Paul Rudolph's powerful architecture, his unique drawings, and his significant teaching have all had a profound influence on the evolution of modern architecture. I therefore hope that he will now be properly recognised as one of America's great post-war architects. Thank you very much. I'll just quickly introduce people you probably have known for many years. Uh, Lord Foster of Thames Patton, on my right, RIBA gold medalist, AIA gold medalist, truly a global architect, but also a man who graduated from Paul Rudolph's master class and indeed worked for him in his office back in 1962. Next, Tony Monk, who you heard uh, just now with his uh, talk about Rudolph, Professor of Architecture at the University of Luton, founding partner of Hudson, Locke and Monk, now better known as HLM. Tony Monk was also a former student of Paul Rudolph in 1963, and of course the author of the book that has brought us all here tonight. And on the far right, Charles Jinks, an architectural historian and style commentator without peer, author of too many books to list and probably best known as the father of postmodernism, or perhaps, in the constructional sense, the developer of postmodernism. As for myself, I'm not a pupil of Rudolph. My chief claim to fame in this connection is having commissioned a profile of him for world architecture from Stephanie Williams in 1992, which unfortunately and accidentally turned out to be the last to be published before his death in 1997. So, to move on, I think, to start with some questions, to open the discussion, I'd like to ask each of our members on the panel here to speak first. To open the discussion, I'd like to ask Norman to say a few words about the experience of being taught by Paul Rudolph, and perhaps to answer the question, how important was he in the evolution of modern architecture because of his teaching ability? Norman. Nothing like a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the debate, didn't expect to. Uh, to have to say anything. Yeah, you've got to say something yeah. first. Um, what was it like to be taught by Paul Rudolph? Um, for me, it was um, it was an incredible revelation because I I'd, um, I'd been through five years of, uh, of a very traditional education in in Manchester where. Um, there was no participation, no debate. Um, there was a great emphasis on drawing, on technical studies, on producing designs, but virtually no um, collective dialogue, no opportunity to actually um, engage in any debate about a, a design. I mean, it was judged in, um, in isolation, um, you were given a mark, maybe three weeks later, you would have very little way of knowing whether the reasons for being marked high or, or, or low. Um, and I think that was typical of many, uh, many schools of architecture at that time. Uh, so to go to, to Yale and, um, and to find this uh, in, I mean, the constants were that the school opened on the first day of term and closed on the last day of term. So it was open 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, 
And that, for me, was, was incredible. Um, the next thing was that Rudolf was, in one sense, predictably unpredictable, in the sense that he would set a, a program for the master's class. It might be five days, say, and, um, and people would work at different paces, but regardless of the progress of the individuals, probably the night before, he would call a snap crit and review the projects and be absolutely tough, ruthless, invite you to challenge. Um, the result was that probably everybody was starting again the night before Handin. And then he would, um, he would spring a project 24 hours and it would be open to the whole school. So everybody would be competing. Year one would be competing against, uh, against the master's class, against second. You know, so. um, he also, for, I mean, I couldn't think of anything more opposite from my experience at, at Manchester in the sense that when you came to the event of a final jury, he would have got the most incredible luminaries uh, from, from New York, from all over the world. I mean, uh, I got recently involved in the Free University of Berlin. Shadrach Woods was one of the, uh, Shadrach Woods was there. I mean, um, if, if I, I, I mean, just an incredible range of talent. Somehow he would draw them and there would be, you know, great kind of theatrical uh, debates. And, um, and he cared passionately uh, about architecture. And, and in a way, the knowledge that this man could single-handedly, probably, uh, I mean, rumor had it, and I'm sure it was rooted in reality, that when he somehow had to create his own office shortly after he'd taken up the post of, uh, of heading out the School of Architecture, um, that he more or less did it over the weekend. And doing it was to do the design and to do every damn working drawing, uh, together with all those extraordinary uh, kinds of drawings that we've, that we've seen. So he had this, uh, he, he also was not, as you say, peddling a style. So he could, he could give you extraordinary personal insights into what he thought might be important about Kahn or Frank Lloyd Wright or Bruce Goff or, or you know, starring them down the road, um, Mies van der Rohe, and in that sense was open to, to any kind of projection that any student might, might make. I mean, I'm quite sure if somebody wanted to do a Gothic folly, he would have judged it on the criteria of whether it was a good Gothic folly or, or, or not. So he, he was incredibly, uh, incredibly open in that sense. It was just inspirational, uh, challenging, uh, demanding, tough, exciting, um, all the things that, uh, you know, if you're really privileged, then uh, as I was and, and others who were students at that time, very, very grateful and still very grateful now. Um, and you I ought to let somebody and you else... And you did his drawings. Yes, I did lots of cross-hatching at $2 an hour for sort of... <laughs> 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 on a lot of those drawings that you've seen. <laughs> In a very humble role, I hasten to add. Right. Well, thank you. Um, Tony, you too were um, a student. Uh, well, does, I, how does that ring several bells with you? Well, yes, I, 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 I won't sort of reiterate because I agree with, with Norman. I think his prodigious energy to work apparently most of the night and be working with us in the studio was uh, a particular important part of it. Um, but it, I think that the thing was particularly that I arrived at Yale and here was somebody who was a, a world leader in design. He was just, he was a tutor, he was teaching me and he was teaching me as a leader as to showing me how to do it. I could go and see what he was doing. If there was any comment that he made I didn't understand, I could go and see some of his buildings. I'd go and get the magazines out and see what he meant. And he talked about design. He talked about space. As, uh, yes, I mean, this, this was also interesting. I mean, as, a, as an architect, you took it for granted that you were concerned about how things looked, how they felt, how they might smell, how the light might come in, the spaces. But, but, but basically, you came out of a background. I came out of a background before I went to the States 
Yale and Rudolph, where you never talked about those things. So to find that the, the, the conversations would hinge centrally around how that building looked. In the, and this guy, I mean, Wellesley College, where he put a modern building in what was not exactly a historic setting, but was, had all the historical trappings. I mean, essentially a kind of reconstructed Gothic uh, setting, which he did masterfully and responding to the climate with, you know, with sun protective Brie Soleil and, and somehow picking up the scale and character and making spaces. It was a curious mixture, really, of being deeply um, influenced by the European tradition of urban spaces. In one sense, he was an anti-American in that sense, but he achieved, because of that more open, go-getting American society and, and, and also the drive to actually do, do buildings. I mean, it was, it was a remarkable combination and obviously had a lot to do with his own educational roots through that. I mean, in some ways, you went to America to rediscover the European tradition. I was slightly disappointed. I thought this um, famous American architect, who was famous by that time, and we knew that that's why we were go going there, that he was somebody of considerable importance. And I was trying to understand what motivated him. And I was sort of slightly disappointed to find that he was re, uh, reliving uh, the historical important things like space and light and proportions and all those things, almost Vitruvian ideas, uh, um, but yet they were extremely important. And yet, of course, Mies van der Rohe and others were f developing a different set of philosophy. So he was returning to some of those and, and, and redoing them. Let me just give you one, because we were talking about the actual education. One day, Rudolf came into the studio and um, all the students, of course, sort of listened to this master who was going to talk about his, his particular work. And he said, now, if I was designing this building and I was Mies van der Rohe, I would do it like this. And he drew a square box, universal space, and it looked very interesting. And he got his, he got his yellow detail paper, which I see you use in your office. Um, <laughs> and he got these rolls of de detail paper, and he did a Mies van der Rohe drawing. Then he said, now, the next, uh, but he said, if I was Frank Lloyd Wright, I'd do it like this, same building clad in a, a Frank Lloyd Wright vernacular. But if I, was, if I was Le Corbusier, I would do it like this, boom, 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 boom. And of course, it was all over the place and very, very artistic. Um, and then he said, but because I'm Paul Rudolph, I would do it like this immac immaculately. And of course, he did it like this very elegantly proportioned. But he was taking your point that he could design. To, if somebody got an idea, he would help to develop it. Now, when he had done these four drawings on this piece of, piece of detail paper, all the students were up this end, taking this all in. But there was a Greek student at this end, winding it all up as it came off the board, off the plate. And when Mr. Rudolph had finished, uh, he went up to Mr. Rudolph and he said, please, would you now sign this? And I know in Delft University, there's a large wall with a piece of four drawings on it that are beautifully framed original Paul Rudolph drawings. <laughs> well, these, these are extraordinary personal insights, but um, I wonder to what extent Rudolph was a child of his period, at the, the time that he belonged to. To what extent he was an anomaly, if you like, in the period of the 1960s job, what do you think? Let me put some other positions uh, in answer to you, uh, Martin. Uh, I agree with uh, Tony that he uh, is uh, and, and remained a late modernist. Uh, I think that's a very good description of, of his position in, in architectural history. And part of his, uh, part of his um, problem, if we call, or you called his demise, uh, or disappearance, um, was, uh, was the history of late, late modernism. In other words, he <coughs> it didn't become as interesting as many other things that were happening at the time. And although he was inventive spatially, I grant, uh, and with light too, uh, he wasn't as inventive as Lou Kahn. I mean, I think that if one compares him to Louis Kahn, and he came on the scene, as you mentioned, at the same time, he didn't have the world uh, um, position that Kahn did. He wasn't in the, in the same class, I wouldn't say. And I say, I think most historians would, would say that. Um, but let me put uh, some other uh, counter statements uh, just to widen the discussion. I was taught at Harvard at the time and um, taught, of course, uh, under the principles of Le Corbusier, and I became um, a fanatic about Corbusier. So 
reading L'Esprit Nouveau, the new spirit of the times, as the underpinning of modernism, uh, uh, I, as so many other Harvard uh, people, were shocked at, uh, at the building of the arts and architecture, not only with, because it was Yale, but <laughs> because we considered it a, a betrayal of uh, everything the modern movement was fought for. So I had meanwhile started a magazine called Connection, and we, I wrote a thing called L'Esprit Nouveau, a mort, a uh, new haven, uh, uh, or meaningless architecture. This was my article. And I sent 250 copies down by automobile uh, so that the Yaleys could read it. And uh, a man st stood around and watched them pick it up. And, and uh, naturally, they picked it up and read it and threw it down in disgust and said, what, what rubbish, <coughs> what, what idiocy. But I'm happy to say that they picked it up again. Um, or at least they told me they did. Uh, what I criticized him for was having uh, 39 different levels in seven floors and having an entrance uh, which, uh, way in which you entered into a blank wall, turned 10 times to get into the, the space to see it you know, over. And you couldn't get to it without making eight more turns. Uh, and it was a maze, in fact, an amazing maze, it's quite true, but uh, splashed around with orange pulsating carpets and uh, a lot of sub-kitsch 19th century statuary, which he embedded, as he said, as happy ruins in the, uh, you know, in the concrete. In any case, and so I was saying this is either a, a very good uh, uh, pasticcio, um, if it were intended, or, or critique of modernism, or, or, or as I read it, uh, a formalist exercise. At the same time, he started appearing on the cover of magazines. And I date the, and this is a very 60s thing, I date the star system to his appearance on the cover of PA. From then on, architects had to appear on covers of magazines. And the cult of the personality took over America and then took over world architecture. And it's never been any change. Of course, it would have happened anyway. We know because of other uh, changes in the media. But this introduced the star system, and he was the star in America for three or four years, from 63 to 67, I would say. And then for all sorts of reasons, I mean, the 60s happened. This, you probably know, this uh, embassy we're sitting in was, uh, if you were out there in 1967, you can well remember being on the other side of this embassy. And, and that's why all the walls are canted now to keep, you know, you charging into the building and burning it down. Anyway, um, his reputation waned, and part of the reason, I think, was his attitude towards function. And this is the one point I want to pick up. He did say several times, and I'm sure you've heard him say this, Norman, that Mies was a very good architect, and the reason was he did wonderful buildings because he ignored many aspects. I'm quoting him now. Many aspects. He ignored many aspects of the building. He said if he solved more problems, his buildings would be far less potent. And this raises the paradox uh, of functionalism of our time. In other words, what Rudolf was doing was producing <coughs> formalist buildings, which you know were quite beautiful, especially in those one-point perspectives, and carrying through one or two or three ideas. But they became, in a sense, one-liner versions of those formalist ideas. And he then went on for the next 20 or 30 years repeating ideas in a way that made him a uh, very identifiable architecture. This is the other thing of the star system. Um, the star system repeats itself because it's necessary to have a brand image. In fact, branding comes from that. And the problem with branding, of course, as a Hollywood actor says, you get typecast in that role and you're always playing Paul Rudolph. Well, it came to the point where, uh, and this is Bob Stern's remark about Michael Graves, after Michael Graves started to repeat himself from 1983 and did self-forgeries for the next 20 years. Um, <laughs> Bob Stern said, he, Bob Stern said, Michael Graves is, is the Paul Rudolph of postmodernism. And I think, you know, it, to a certain extent, I mean, that, that cutting, this cutting truth in that, uh, in that critique. And I think, I mean, I, what I've heard tonight and what I've seen, I respect Rudolph's uh, work. I think I was uh, too puritanical in my early critiques. Um, he obviously was a, a very, very competent and uh, committed architect. And um, I think he'll be judged as one of the great late modernists. 
I'd like to ask each member of the panel to make a brief statement and uh, then we'll close. Thank you. Norman, you first. I don't know what to add. I mean, I think that we've seen so many different dimensions of, a, uh, of an individual. I think that um, if more people who come into contact with, uh, with Paul Rudolph, either as students or clients or whatever, would add more dimensions. I think that um, that's, in a way, why he's so intriguing as a teacher and an architect. Well, I'd like to say that Paul Rudolph lives on. He lives on um, through, uh, obviously, in Asia, through his work, which is highly regarded there. I'm delighted to see that I've been able to illustrate 25 years of Rudolph's further progression, which I hope everybody on this panel and everybody recognises now that he did achieve some very famous and, and fine buildings. And he lives on, too, through the people who he inspired. And Norman Foster is one of them, Richard Rogers is another, and, and a whole galaxy of stars who still live on. And through, th whether it was inspiration or mimicking or being provoked by him, whatever, he certainly contributed to my career, and I think he contributed to others as well. Well, let me completely reverse everything I've said uh, previously um, uh, and say that I, if you classify him as an ecstatic architect and you look <laughs> at his... <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, thank you, Norman. I, and you look at his see-through glass uh, apartment, and you look at his really outrageously over-the-top interiors, of which he did a few really nice ones, mm -hmm. then, you know, they're really wonderful. They're luxurious, they're funny, they're outrageous, they're completely convincing on a private level. It's great, great private architecture. You've heard it now. I think my own, the only thing I could add is uh, a quote, another quote from Paul Rudolph about Walter Gropius, which is, he showed us how to break with the past. And I think that when we talk about, when we talk about Rudolph surviving and Rudolph having some reality even today, it is precisely because he learned that. And that was an essential element in, the mod in modern teaching. It taught you how to get away from the past. And I think Rudolph did that. Thank you very much. Thank you.